the task for this lecture and the title for this lecture is coming from an invitation from Eva and others when they relaunched the uh, AA files uh, to speak about the subject of experimentation. And experimentation for me is something that uh, not only is it important, it, it somehow drives everything that I believe in. And with that, the reason for that is uh, primarily to do with the idea of trying to somehow situate what it means to be a designer or an architect in the world and to understand what that really means and the role that design means in a world that is completely uncertain, latent, and constantly evolving. Uh, so the pieces of paper and for my students, they, I tell them not to read anything. You're going to excuse me after 18 years teaching here. I'm going to read something for the first time. And uh, just as some small summaries from the text, because in some way it will bookend the beginning of that article and the end of the article, uh, what this is all about. Um, the title is really based on a man named John Baldessari, who recently passed away. And uh, yeah, he said, I will not make any more boring art. And the reason that he said that, uh, he literally passed away like three days ago. Uh, was at a moment of kind of critical self-reflection in his own practice and in a certain way, uh, I'll speak to it by just reading what I wrote. In the summer of 1970, John Baldessari drove 123 paintings he had in a studio that he made from May 1953 to March 1966 to a local mortuary. He proceeded to cremate them. The ash produced baked into cookies that would later be placed in a vessel taking the form of a leather-bound book. In one action, shedding his practice from the orthodoxies of medium specificity, while at the same time creating the opportunity to conceptualize anew questions of art and his practice within the discipline. The creative impulse at times demands acts of erasure. Beyond action, style, or statement, experimentation is the only means we have to question and challenge the habitual. What is of consequence is the pursuit to challenge everything, enable our understanding of the world through this pursuit. A year after his action, Baldessari declared, I will not make any more boring art. And with this statement, expressed a life's foray into pioneering what became known as conceptual art. Experimental practice demands more. Experimentation, this word within architecture, haunts and yet always has stood for something that attempts to demand more. To expand the finite orthodoxies of what is taught and the assumptions made in this world, it is an action that affords understanding, even in its failure and offering of the struggle to create. It is the opportunity we construct to engage and challenge things. It is at the heart an attempt to ask more informed questions of the world and our participation in it. Experimentation and method and practice is enabled by curiosity, the desire to create and evolve our understanding. It is beyond building, style, economy, history, or discourse. Architecture, with all of its paradoxes, remains a space for interrogation through this action and time. It challenges us to see history as something plural rather than linear and constructed. Experimentation gives agency. Architecture is space. We may agree on this, and even with this agreement, we don't really say very much. Space like time is construction. Concepts that have no finite form or understanding though govern much of what we spend our time attempting to relate to. Time is our medium. We live and practice in time and yet this is also not finite. The acclaimed physicist Carlo Rovelli speaks of time as something elastic. Our world understood as moments in time. Our observation of the world is ours, a radical constructivist approach to philosophy that in summary can under be understood as follows. Everyone's observation and understanding of the world are their own and inaccessible to others, be that man or machine. If we expand on this statement, the obvious appears that even our most objective pursuits in science or math by necessity acknowledges a system's bias and its capacity to observe and understand. 
These biases are as much embedded in human as they are in non-human observations and learning. To understand this, one needs not only to look at just recent habit-forming tendencies of how AI is practiced, but Gödel's and completeness theorems that lend themselves to understand that even in our attempts to compute the world, we must acknowledge that within mathematical logic and philosophy, this attempt in itself is limited, if not paradoxical. Constructing the means to understand is dynamic and evolving. I'm going to stop for now, and I'm going to sort of continue a little bit. So with that, yeah, let's do it like this. I'm still doing stuff. Um, this is a quite famous movie that premised the fact that future was always something that was being speculated in architecture and urbanism. Uh, Blade Runner has been obviously sourced in many kinds of things, but the future on Blade Runner took place in November 2019. So the future is in our past. And science fiction, for sure, is something that, to be honest with you, is still looking in the rearview mirror, as McLuhan would say. So one of the issues, uh, speaking to Blade Runner with the anniversary and all of the things that were happening, was that Blade Runner has officially caught up with the real world. What does that mean? There was a lot of conversation that Blade Runner spoke about the world as this topic conversations about speaking to things and then being able to sense and sentient beings, all of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And it takes place in a Los Angeles, which is supposed to be in a certain way, uh, the product of ill human engagement. And somehow urbanization was deemed to be like that. If we look at Los Angeles, or if we look at basically what's been happening recently, 2019, you'll start to see like, parallels to this idea of dystopia, but very real, very changing, very permanent. And we are also going to see the relationship between mediation and what those kind of implications happen. If you saw Facebook recently with the Australian fires, you would see this image and everybody knows it. What they don't know about the image is that the image is a one month mapping. This wasn't one real time snapshot from NASA. This was a compilation of a month. It doesn't change the severity of all of the things, absolutely not. It just shows that the complexity of what it is, when we say that data is the new money, or when we say all of these kind of things, our ability to sense and understand is, is really challenged. Also with the immediacy to actually kind of understand the complexities and the challenges of what we're doing. The 60s and 70s had a whole series of kind of radicals who were somehow speaking to this. And one of the maybe challenges that we have today is also to revisit maybe some of the conversations, not necessarily the projects. There's a radical group called Ant Farm, and this is a project called Media Burn, and they were speaking in a certain sense as an action to some of these kinds of issues of mediation. If we speak about people like Yves Klein, at the same time when we'd be speaking about the world as a provocation that will raise everything at the surface of the entire earth until it's completely flat and fill the valleys and mountains and pour concrete over the surface of all continents. This was a provocation by Yves Klein, but this is the reality that we know today. Most of these kind of visionary or utopian kind of ideas that somehow are dismissed from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and some sense have taken form, but one can question if vision was a really big part of that. At the same time, I think there were certain conversations and ones that I think when we sit in between a context of crisis, and I think we live in an age where yesterday's news seems to have kind of come and gone, uh, we feel sometimes that we don't have the capacity to really engage, to be able to have agency in the world. And agency doesn't come by everybody sort of shouting the same stuff. Agency comes by a recognition of actually understanding what we can do to participate to us challenge to a system, to a crisis, and in particular to architects, I think, who in a certain sense seem to be riding different kinds of trends. This is a kind of dedication that is a lifetime's work to be able to meaningfully contribute in some way 
And collectively, I think it's super important. And this was talked about in design in many different ways. And there was a quite an important book by Victor Papanek, uh, who it's always used as a subject to think about design in more generic ways in terms of the everyday. But Papanek speaks on design for the real world as design must be innovative, highly creative, cross-disciplinary, tool responsive to the needs of men. It must be more research-oriented and must stop defiling the earth itself with poorly designed objects and structures. <coughs> this is a man who was obviously very deeply connected with ecology and social change and many of the projects that are spoken about within the visionary kind of platform of discourses were not visionary just because they proposed things in a megalomaniac way, I think they were visionary from a different perspective. Uh, I don't know if people know what this image is, but it's an image of a gorilla's hand. Now, one of the issues about a lot of the conversations about nature and ecology is, to be honest with you, there's probably a limitation in language when we speak about some of these words, about what we actually mean. So this is a hand of a gorilla, and the gorilla has a disease. A disease, a pigmentation disease, meaning that it loses its fur. When it's lost its fur, you may find something that appears to actually kind of have very close characteristics to maybe some of our little digits as well. What does it really mean when we start to really see ourselves much more a part of something, an observer, not only of some kind of world in nature and all of these other aspects of environments and systems, but actually deeply embedded in it? Systems today, I think, in some ways, uh, have been talked about a lot uh, in the conversations that we had, but they also are problematized by what Papanek was speaking about in terms of the real world. What are we talking about when we speak about matter and materiality? How do things go out in the world? What are the things that we're actually looking at? And what you're looking at right now is water. When we speak about nature, we can consider a sort of idea of taxonomy. When we design things, we design things without not fully understanding what the purpose may be at the time. Why because we are trying to construct a certain kind of approach which is prototypical, which means that it could be context-aware and context-specific, but they would have to be able to take on those constraints. And one way of looking is also to start to understand how we sort of work on these kind of challenges how we see matter as something that's not inert. Materials have life cycles, are also part of a system. People that were also very important, not only important to the DRL, institutes that I think I could say with Patrick we would share, that like in Stuttgart with Fry Otto and others, we're setting up kind of research paradigms to explore things. The conversations of those kind of attempts, and I'm gonna read a little bit more, but I think is important to somehow situate it, were also responses to kind of post-disaster, post-war, sensibilities that we're trying to provoke, I think, realities of working in moments and time where resources were not something that were taken for granted. Uh, when the social impetus of actually doing more with less was put out in the world, and when trying to understand how the built environment integrated itself within larger kind of structures, some of them social, some of them physical, and obviously societal in all aspects. In this book, actually, there is also an article uh, that Fry Otto uh, had actually asked of Jonah Friedman. There's a chapter on adaptive building and adaptive architectures. And in the context of self-building and self-planning, the, the scale of the implications of what was actually being discussed was actually looking at the scale of materiality all the way through building. In the AA, for example, if you look at the go upstairs, there's an IL on bamboo. And that bamboo research was a research just trying to explore pliancy, buildability, looking at different kinds of materials and their properties. And these are two pages from that bamboo research by Fry Otto and the Institute. On the right, you can see that it doesn't look like bamboo. It turned into research about steam bending and different pliancies. And on the left is a project that may be familiar to a students at Hook Park, which is that same strategies were actually implemented in one of the buildings that we have with Fry Otto and uh, others that basically are part of our extended AA campus. 
When we think about some of the things today, I think one of the things that new tools have sort of offered us, but this isn't new in any way, is the ability of looking at time, and it's also the ability of looking at sort of aspects of how things can somehow use a digital materiality and think about behavior as opportunities to actually think about how organizational systems could actually offer possibilities creating spaces, have semi-autonomous or autonomous abilities to be able to participate, problematize, and offer something. The digital world in many of the things that we've been working on, specifically in my studio with Mustafa and Apple and others, uh, have very much been not necessarily just working within digital behaviors, but trying to manifest those in more analog ways trying to develop the control system, some of the prototypes that you see and things like that, demand a kind of aspect of control which is not necessarily always very one way. Control is an illusion. We believe that we can sort of control things, but actually systems and themselves, materials, all kinds of aspects of complexity enter whenever one thinks about this. When we start to think about the notion of tools, we should also have a kind of expanded sense of what that means today. Tools does not mean software. Tools are actually instruments that allow us to integrate, interrogate, explore, be curious about. And we make them to help us make that not only accessible, but also to extend our own capacities. So in the 70s, for example, you had something like the Whole Earth Catalog. And it was an attempt to basically catalog all the tools in the world. And that attempt lasted about five years. And the issue of that, obviously this is pre-internet and all of that stuff in an expanded sense, was really to make that available to everyone with the idea that if you make things available to everyone, interesting things not only happen, but you get a better understanding of actually what is it that we're speaking about? What is the world that we're sort of operating in? And this image obviously is of Earth and so forth. It's also very similar to our poster for tomorrow's open day. The reality of a lot of these things I think is really important. But also the curiousness of maybe some of the language that was used in the first catalog of the Whole Earth Catalog, uh, you have these two quotes in the introduction. We are, as gods, and might as well get used to it, reads the first catalog statement of purpose. A realm of intimate personal power is developing. Power of the individual to conduct his own education, find his own inspiration, shape his own environment, and shape his adventure with whoever is interested. A realm of intimate personal power is developing, blah, blah, blah. This is a mistake, but let's just say it's up there twice for emphasis. A recent New Yorker article revisited the Whole Earth Catalog, and, uh, and it spoke to it, a woman named Anna Weiner. At the height of the civil rights movement and the war in Vietnam, the Whole Earth Catalog offered a vision for a new social order, one that eschewed institutions in favor of individual empowerment, achieved through the acquisition of skills and tools. The latter category included agricultural equipment, weaving kits, mechanical devices. Books like the Kibbutz, Venture, and Utopia, and digital technologies related to theoretical texts such as Viner's Cybernetics and Hewlett Packard's 9100A, a programmable calculator. This is basically how that was really executed. Yeah. Sending stuff in, clippings from things, very analog kind of way of data mining and sourcing, and yet the attempt was to reach out and to be global. With super minimal means, this kind of process of actually thinking and doing became a lexicon of actually what was at the time. If that kind of gives us an idea of what the tools of that time was, today, to be honest with you, we may have a other means of doing that. So somebody asked me if I have Elon Musk in the presentation today as one of our critics, because I guess I'm a technophile in some utopic, dystopic, and very real way. 
YouTubers are using deep fake technology yeah. in some very funny ways. At number one, the fakening, who put Elon Musk's face on Charlie Sheen. That's how I roll. I have one speed. I have one gear. Go. Put Kevin Hart on Mr. T. I just want to shake some sense with you kids. And swap Tom Hanks for Keanu Reeves in Forrest Gump. Mama said they'd take me anywhere. <laughs> She said they was my magic shoes. All right, Forrest. Open your eyes now. Face so for those that don't know what deep fakes actually are, what this, this is basically algorithms playing with our faces, superimposing things. If we try to take a litmus test of all of those things, even what constitutes an image today is something that's questioned. The reality of what that actually means, if it's generated, if it's real, and the strategies and the thinking behind all of this stuff, I think, is important to somehow consider, where at a moment, a lot of architects are basically speaking about constructing new images or post images, and there's a whole idea of conversations about the role of the image today. It's almost perversely kind of antithetical to actually a world where images themselves are somehow been rendered to actually not speak to something that's legitimate. And film directors have known this for a long time, but for us, I think it puts into question how we work on some of these things. In the studio, to be honest, we've tried to explore very different things. We've had teams that are trying to look at how brain sensing could potentially sort of offer different ways of communication and how those things could somehow be somehow explored within models that are machine learned and what learning actually means to a machine versus learning for us as it stands right now, are, are very different. Reward systems in a certain way that reinforce habit. And so even opening up this conversation of learning and trying to understand and train and work through these things to problematize things that are not necessarily given are really important challenges today. And last year, this was one of the projects uh, basically trying to work on some of these problems. And in the studio in general, I think that there is a a desire to actually see what is offered by working within systems that actually offer us the capacity to actually question actually what is intelligence. Uh, intelligence in a certain sense in a lot of the conversations, at least in my studio, is not something that's attributed to a thing itself. Uh, one could say that intelligence is a product of the interaction between things, if that's human, if it's non-human, between human and human, between humans and machines, and machines interacting with other machines. These are attempts, attempts from the last five years that we've been sort of working on. And I think one of the things when we took on the subject of constructing agency was really about trying to understand where agency somehow is somehow embedded within strategies of living, within the idea of self-organization, within the tools that we're sort of working on and how to sort of open those things to be something that's public and shared. And Sajay and Alicia's studio, that is sort of being problematized in a certain way by using game engines as a strategy to basically develop different ways of sort of engaging those kind of conversations. With Patrick and Pierre Andrea, the idea of the crowd within the work environment as being something that's changing within a finite building with kinetic features or something that's being looked at. In our studio, like the article that I've uh, put forward and premised, I think a lot of those things is about sort of speaking about what does it mean to develop an architecture that's self-aware, that self-structures, uh, that doesn't believe in blueprints or master plans. So in some way, this kind of conversation is not coming out of nowhere. Uh, I think over the last 20 some odd years, I've had the opportunity to work uh, for people, and even if I respect them quite a lot, and I respect the act of building buildings within a research paradigm, to be honest, I felt very important to separate at a certain level the way that we sort of explore research. At the moment, Everything is called research. Everybody in the school does research. Every piece of design is research. And I think the reality about research is that it, it doesn't necessarily guarantee results. It's not easily describable. And it's only through failure that you actually achieve anything. And without risk, which, to be honest with you, comes very much in terms of bringing things out in the world, it becomes very difficult to evaluate how that is sort of put in the world. I started my career post-DRL uh, at Peter Eisenman's office, and pretty young at the time.
uh, being given over two of six buildings that were basically being designed and put on site from a competition. And the challenges of scale and things like that that we're speaking about offered up a lot of conversations. And I'm not going to talk about formalism or even my small sort of foray in Zaha's office when in 2003 we did this competition. And it's not a critique of that work. But it was a conversation at a certain point that really spoke in a lot of the things that I do with my brother, at the same time also working here as a, as a tutor, to sort of open up a conversation that was from my generation. Now, if I'm really honest with you, my generation is, I'm not really sure what my generation is. Um, but I did work with my brother quite a lot, and he's not an architect, and he was designing interfaces, and he was looking, he's an artist. And one of the things that we spoke about was the idea that space was our medium. And in a certain sense, space is basically what we define architecture and time. And we've had, I think, over the last 15 years plus, had the opportunity of developing projects. And the projects for a lot of people are not architecture. Even my mother, which I gave the thanks to, uh, will look at a project like some of the stuff that I've spent a lot of time on and basically say, uh, I used to understand what you did as an architect when you were at Eisenman's. Um, are you still doing architecture? And, and it's something that I think is an interesting question because in some way, this idea of expanding the definition of what architecture is was always something that was very important because in some sense, I didn't have an answer. And I think a lot of the pursuits of the things that we do and why we work in the way that we do is in a certain way to sort of problematize and to test. So what does it mean to make an AI bot? What does it mean to put it out in the world? In the simplistic ways, how does it learn? How does it interact with people? What is the emotive relationships to things? These are kinds of questions that we couldn't have conceptualized all from the beginning, but we used a lot of installations and worked with some ex-students and with my brother and other colleagues to try to sort of figure those things out. And then those things take on a life of their own. This thing has been touring for six years. And I was just told I just got back here. But it sets up situations, and the situations for us have been really learning tools, because in some way, this isn't about making kinetic sculpture, and this isn't about uh, conversations that are happening around it. But you see that there's a culture of discussions that are around a lot of these things. Some of them focus on technology, like I mentioned in my last comments. Other ones are speculations about the motivations behind why one does what one does. And for the longest time, a lot of these kind of robotic projects and the aspect of cuteness was discussed today, but also this idea that these things are pets and we're going to replace animals and all of these other things. At the same time as that project, we were working on a national park with Ranzo Piano as an invited uh, architect artist group, uh, which will be the first national park in Athens uh, to basically deal with the illumination concept for 760 acres. And that also being developed with two kind of peer structures, the challenges of those things, what an artificial kind of garden could be to think about how some of those things actually are. And this is kind of my moment of self-justification that I say that I'm an architect, even if I'm not licensed and probably are in trouble by saying that. But we work on buildings as well and we work on things. A lot of the things that we do on each project in a certain way makes demands that sometimes make building not the answer. Uh, maybe the thing that uh, my brother and I are probably the most engaged with was the first opportunity that we had in Trafalgar Square in a public space to make an intervention. And uh, the curator at the time, which I always use this project as an example, uh, basically asked us what our intervention would be, and we said that we wanted to animate the built environment through conversation. And we said Trafalgar Square was always a space for people to protest and to celebrate. And we felt that public space today was an important thing. This was in 2008. And the premise of it was just to speak about two technologies, one really old and one really new. One was mobile SMS texting, and the other one was smoke signals, which is a 5,000-year-old practice of abstract smoke. 
The idea of using the city as a canvas and to hold conversations through that, the conversations of planning that took a year to happen, tools that we had to develop because we had to speak to issues of rioting and things like that. These kind of things are things that one starts to understand the context of those things. We did it again in Detroit, and since we did it in Detroit, there's a light biennial now that runs every two years, because the idea of developing a context, even if it was for two and a half hours for three nights, could have lasting memory in terms of the kinds of conversations, what an event actually was in a certain place. We've developed strategies for event, motive, rooms. We've done stuff with 3D printing, like a shiz lounge, and though I hate furniture, if I'm really honest with you, we decided to do one just for the hell of it. Uh, conversations about how you could take architecture with you, uh, textiles, which could be in your pockets, could come out and could be cast or have compacted earth, strategies for deployability and using, I think as Patrick would say, the art world in a certain way to be able to test things. So in a lot of ways, developing strategies to think about how these soft cast techniques could be actually constructing architectures. Uh, if people recognize the guy with the ponytail, that's Sanjay, just so I can tease him. But, uh, one of the things about work here, which I think is really important, and I think is very important in terms of the conversations today, the relationships between schools and practices, but practices in a very expanded way, is to really think about the community and how they can participate in sort of developing things. So if it's vehicles or if we're working on glass, a lot of the things that we're doing, a lot of the challenges that we're doing, this is uh, for Somerset House, where my studio is based, uh, trying to make a lattice structure of 1,500 glass orbs. I'm not going to use the word balls today. I think it was used enough. And that environment, just like the DRL, I think, is something where, you know, is working with very modest means. We, we really don't have much. At the same time, we have everything because we have a belief in some sense that people are coming with the motivation to try to explore ideas in whatever forms they are. So the prototypes that you see on the table and so forth are proof of concepts, but they're really learning tools. They're for us to basically demystify a lot of the things, a lot of the technologies, and to enable, I think, a certain form that architecture can participate and engage with these kind of information-rich environments that are shaping our lives constructing frameworks that can allow for change and can embrace the unknown. So if it's flying stuff, if it's developing these kind of self-assembled strategies and noticing by putting things in the world that people find sometimes things cute, and maybe that's not a bad thing if somehow that makes that an aspect of the project itself. But realistically speaking, a lot of those things and a lot of the issues around robotics also challenged a certain preoccupation of what, what is it in the world that we're speaking about. And some of the fundamental people that worked in automation and robotics at MIT at the same time were things like the architecture machine group and so forth were people like Rodney Brooks. And in 1997, there was a documentary basically called Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control uh, that basically asked him, about the status of robotics and how that was somehow seeping into the everyday and the role of automation and all of these other aspects, things that people are very much afraid of, taking your job, doing this, doing that. And I think the conversation with Rodney Brooks, particularly to robotics, because he also moved away from automation as a, as a very linear idea of production in an assembly line format, and spoke about, I think, a, an aspect of robotics that, to be honest with you, basically we're speaking about the very many populations, small, nimble, some will do the job, some will die, but in the end, job will get done, he says. But one other aspect he said is that it's going to be harder to distinguish what is alive and what is a machine. And that boundary may become, in some sense, meaningless. I mentioned that Fry Auto uh, document, and with the Fry Auto document, I just mentioned a little bit about the Friedman piece. Friedman, at that moment in time, was talking about free planning. Uh, he was talking about participatory systems, and he was really somehow speaking to the fact that a lot of the things 
practically uh, within architecture we're not adaptive. But he said, practically any building can be adaptable. It can be used in many different ways, but who should decide how it should be used? Evidently, it is their future user. Now, the future user cannot explain the preference causally to an intermediary expert like an architect or a planner. And if this expert is supposed to serve great many future users, this communication difficulty grows enormously. An architect or a planner cannot know because of his communication difficulties what to do in order to satisfy the future user. Thus, however, we turn this problem, the solution of crisis of the architecture leads to its simplification of a condition. The future user himself has to decide and the future user, in some sense, has to have agency. If you take some of those concepts, if you look at Yona Friedman's drawings, they're quite simplified ideas of grids and people basically filling those things. He had concepts of flat rider and others, which basically were trying to develop instruction manuals to allow people to create space. We know that a lot of those things doesn't necessarily always enable people to do. And I think we learn from a lot of these kind of experiments. But I think one of the speculations in the studio, anyhow, from the kinds of work that we're doing is that if we construct things that actually are not giving options, like you're designing a Nike shoe and you could change colors, but are actually problematizing themselves spatially. Could those things open up possibilities for people through their engagement and interaction to sort of create space? And I think the behaviors that we actually see, I think, are, in some sense, from our perspective, opportunities to basically mitigate some of these things. And the idea of the collective or the shared and the participatory, not necessarily just being about people building their own spaces, but things themselves interacting, participating also with human intervention, and in a certain sense, constructing things. I'm going to finish with one project and just one small paragraph, and I'm sure that everybody is destroyed and wants to get out. Um, but I think it's important to turn the attention a little bit to the city. Uh, the city in terms of urbanism, I think, has always been both a model for a lot of self-organizational strategies, a desire about what future living actually is, and also sometimes a problem of how we sort of deal with some of that stuff. And these kind of ideas of what the vision of the future was, was not a speculation of great leaps of faith. This was basically what was being worked on in 1913. Now, those things weren't being realized. I've spoken in the past about some of this kind of image constructions about what future visions are. This is a TFL image of what London is supposed to be in 2026. And even in places like where I, I work in Somerset House, the London mayor uh, comes to an opening of an exhibition of the project that I will show you, uh, that I've developed with my brother in minimum forms and other colleagues called the Motive City, but with the premise that he's trying to keep culture in London by, in a certain sense, supporting the fact that uh, first artist residencies, in a certain sense, would be in central London. When we speak about the idea of the city, a lot of the issues around the subject, from my perspective, is coming from challenges with infrastructure and the relationship between architecture and infrastructure. And if you look at visionary ideas of what the city was, Frank Lloyd Wright with Broadacre City also spoke about mobility, and you see flying machines. And if you look at the cars that were designed, there were single occupancy monowheels. And in some way, maybe that was fantasy at the time, but there is also, I think, some very interesting kind of correlations with things today. So deployability doesn't necessarily mean take a house and just sort of drop it somewhere. We've had those conversations in the 60s and 70s. But I think the challenge of mobility and the challenge of a lot of these things through mass migration issues, through disaster complexities and all kinds of things, the necessity to think about things prototypically exist. You see these kind of ideas of mobility within the city, if it's balloons, as basically being communication devices and internet like Google will sort of launch, or if it's drones and what Amazon is speaking to, they are basically speaking about a certain challenge. If you think about how many Amazon deliveries you guys had Christmas time, probably a lot. If you think about an urbanization like New York, which is supposed to be a city where those Amazon deliveries are supposed to be driven, 
uh, through on this kind of idea of consumption. You have a half million deliveries. Let's say the drones do, you know, I'm not good with math right now, but you understand that you would have a hell of a lot of drones doing a lot of stuff in really compact areas. So some of the conversations about these things being scary, your world is going to get really frightening if you think that drone delivery packages are something that is just going to be all joy. The infrastructures behind those things, I think, are going to open up something very different. It's not scary, it's not good, it's not bad, but I think there's a complexity there that nobody is speaking about. And autonomous cars are really easy because they're on the ground and all they're doing is what your Uber driver does every day. So your Uber driver is not really driving you. He's basically taking instruction and directions using Waze, using other kind of companies. The whole Earth catalog, if I also want to just give a little bit of history, was very influential to people that set up Airbnb, Facebook, a whole series of these kind of startup cultures that were looking for these kind of infrastructures as well. The challenges of urbanism, we always talk about it in terms of congestion and parking and streets and uh, how many people can fit in the tube line. And then we also have also an understanding of a world which is a little bit different from this world which is like issues that Hilbersheimer or Korb and other people would be looking at. We also have this world where the conversation about how things take decisions and the role of autonomy and all of these things also have a lot of issues in impacting the way that we deal with legal structures and a whole series of other things. Technology is not something that's outside of us. Technology is us, and it has all of the complexities and burdens through that. The challenges of how we read things in the studio, I think, have always tried to look at that coupling. Like Frank Lloyd Wright's Mono Wheel, and this was a project in the DRL that took the idea of a shared automobile as something that could be like a Barclays bike uh, distributed within the city. The car itself would self structure, and the car itself would construct a charging area by looking at spaces that were not occupied as a distributed system, and in a certain sense, construct uh, spaces. For for temporary kind of occupations. The issues around some of that stuff computationally would allow us to see these things in maybe more of a pure form about what's controlling, what a monowheel actually is, and so forth. And I think I'm going to end the conversation a little bit with a role of how architects discuss this today. Uh, Rem Koolhaas is a pretty famous person in this building and pretty much everywhere else. And Rem's idea about smart cities and how these technologies are impacting uh, basically, basically said to the fact that a smart city is not very intelligent. Uh, he called it stupid. And he may be right, but what's wrong is then to speak about the rural as a somehow antidote to this. Because we see in the history of cycles of occupation, things are always migrating between in and out of the city. Rem's problem with the smart city is not being addressed. His critique is not necessarily proposing an alternative. And in the studio, I would suggest, and I think the DRL has suggested in some different forms, if it was through parametric urbanism or others, that computation in some way may help to be able to deal with these kind of complexities. Algorithms basically run on the back end of everything that we do. This isn't something that is new. The reality of those things is that it doesn't necessarily inform a lot of the things that we're doing spatially that has to do outside of our human behavior. And a lot of the strategies of learning, I think, are contingent about focusing on models that are not about learning what we do and our habits, like chatbots looking at Facebook and Twitter feeds. These things are easy. Or if you go to Nokia Labs and stuff like that, they're basically mining a lot of social media to basically get a window into how the urban environment is. We understand that that data is data that we put out in the world. It's not data that's necessarily driven by the world itself. So conversations that were happening like within the studio and so forth were somehow constructing strategies, in our case, for what we deemed uh, an emotive city. And in some way, we spoke about this idea as an augmentation to all of that. We just recently showed this in Taipei, and very quickly to understand a lot of these things, a lot of the data that could drive almost all aspects of our human engagement, governments basically put that out there. So you have live data that can drive everything 
agriculture, civil administration, environmental protection, news. They have all of these things as information that's real time and live streamed and in a certain sense are there to be actually used, but very few people engage in that without really within the architecture to try to understand maybe how other people are seeing these kind of bits of information. So we tried in a certain way to see how communication was being featured with the idea that if you would allow people to engage with each other through solely their behavior on everyday environments that you could organize a strategy for what a self-organizing city would be. I'll end with the, with the last paragraph. In 1984, Andrea Giulio, Andrea Juno, sorry, and Valahana Vale interviewed J.G. Ballard and was asked, what is his greatest fear about the future? He stated, I would sum up my fear about the future on one word, boring. And this is my one fear, that everything that has happened, nothing else existing or new or interesting will ever happen again. The future will be a vast conforming suburb of the soul. Rovelli would say that there is no such thing as future in physics. Marshall McLuhan would suggest to consider the future as actually our present because we find ourselves living in the past. Considering the future present, we may agree we live in an age where science fiction has become fact. Our contemporary age is as radical with change, latency, and uncertainty becoming the new norm. As we prototype our collective presence, we may consider that there is no architecture without experimentation. I will not make any more boring architecture. You will not make any more boring architecture. And we will not make any more boring architecture. I leave you with a lecture title that Wolf Pricks uh, basically showed in a lecture that he gave here about seven years ago. And he basically said, in two days, tomorrow will be yesterday. So even when we speak about the future, and two days after the review, all of the stuff will be in the past. So thank you very much for your attention.